Last week, we read about Jesus' very first day in public ministry, chapter one of Mark's gospel. Jesus was in the synagogue teaching. As Father Mark highlighted last week, we don't know what Jesus was teaching, but Mark wanted us to know that he was teaching with authority, and the people were astonished. Today's gospel picks up right where last Sunday left off. And we know that because the very first line of today's gospel was after leaving the synagogue, and then Jesus continues on this first day of his public ministry. So three simple points from today's readings. First, teach, heal, pray. Second, don't wait. And third, grasped by the hand. First, teach, heal, pray. What does Jesus do on this first day? He begins his ministry strong, and he will repeat what he does through this first day throughout his entire short life on earth. He teaches, he heals, and he prays. After teaching in the synagogue last week, he's asked by Peter and Andrew to come to Peter's house. Peter's mother-in-law lay ill. Now, Jesus could not have known Peter's mother-in-law very well at this point, if at all. He had just met Peter, but he, we read, he grasps her by the hand and helps her up. Then the word quickly gets out and others, most likely completely complete strangers to Jesus, bring their sick and their infirmed and the possessed to him, and he does the same thing. He grasps their hands and he helps them up. Then early the next morning, Jesus takes time to get up by himself to pray. Sometimes in the Gospels, we are told the words that Jesus uses when he prays, but kind of last week when we don't really know what Jesus was teaching, we don't know what Jesus was praying or what he prayed for in today's Gospel. We just know how he prayed. He prayed early in the morning, by himself, off in a quiet place. So in this very short excerpt from the first chapter of Mark, we really see the blueprint for the entire ministry of Jesus Christ. He teaches, he heals, and he prays. Second point, don't wait. What we see from today's reading that I think is somewhat striking is that Jesus wastes no time going about his work. He begins his ministry right away. The way this passage is written, St. Mark wants us to know that Jesus gets about the work of his father without a lot of delay. St. Mark actually uses the word immediately in his gospel like 40 times. Jesus is in the synagogue healing, we hear last week. Then he goes directly to Peter's house to heal, and then in the morning he goes out to a deserted place to pray. All within the same day or within the same 24-hour period. Like Jesus teaching with authority, there's a lesson for us right there from the very beginning of Mark's gospel about our work as followers of Jesus. Don't wait. As followers of Jesus, all of us in this church know that we are called to teach, to heal, and to pray, to be teachers to our children, to be healers to our family and friends, to be prayers to our community, for our community, our parish, our entire world. But it's so easy to put off this call. I, for one, am the king of procrastinators. If there is a task that I can put off, I will find the flimsiest reason to put it off, to find excuses why I can't be bothered, to not have a difficult conversation, to pass on that task that I've been meaning to do, but just haven't gotten around to it. In fact, in today's gospel, it's almost like I wanna tell Jesus, wait a minute, slow down here. Slow down, you're gonna burn yourself out, Jesus. 
He goes from one moment of ministry to the next. Mark says he goes from Peter's house right after he's in the synagogue. Peter and Andrew immediately tell Jesus about Peter's mother-in-law, who's in need of healing. And after Jesus heals her, that same evening, the whole town is gathered at the door. And even then, Jesus doesn't sleep in. He rises early, very early in the morning to pray, perhaps to thank his heavenly Father for giving him the strength and the power and the courage to have such a productive first day of ministry. What do our days of teaching and healing and praying look like? Mine do not look a lot like Jesus's. They may look a little like Jesus's. I might teach a little bit or pray a little bit, but mostly I'll do that next week. I'm too tired or I'm too busy or I'm too distracted. Mark in his gospel today is encouraging us, don't wait, get going. There's much work to be done. Third point, grasp by the hand. It's impossible to deliver a homily today without reflecting at least for a moment on that first reading that Rick read from the book of Job. You may recall a couple of weeks ago, we read from the book of Jonah and Father Mark in his homily commented that we don't hear from the book of Jonah very often. In fact, in the three year cycle of, of Sunday readings, we only hear from the book of Jonah once, one year out of the three. And the same is true for the book of Job. We hear very little from the book of Job in our Sunday cycle, one, sun, one cycle every three years. And we may remember vaguely about the book of Job and about Job. He's this character, a, a good and righteous man from everything that is in, in the book in the Old Testament who, who faces tremendous suffering for no apparent reason. He loses his family, he loses his property, he loses his children. And on more than one occasion in the book of Job, today among them, he speaks about complete hopelessness complete despair. I shall not see happiness again. Scholars tell us that the book of Job is one of the most beautiful literary pieces in the entire Bible. But man, is it tough to read. It's tough to read because Job reminds us every one of us either has, has, have had or will have experiences of pain suffering or death in our lives or sin. And we will say to ourselves what Job says, I shall not see happiness again. Just like the passage we read from Jonah two weeks ago, this is just one snippet from the book of Job and happens to catch Job at his lowest point. The story gets better for Job by the end of the book but it does not diminish the power of the lesson that without Jesus going to the cross and rising from the dead and even knowing and believing and understanding that beauty, that truth, it can be difficult to understand and make sense of human suffering and loss. Peter's mother-in-law must have felt that way. All of those who live their entire lives with various diseases who were brought to Jesus that day probably felt that way. We feel that way. I feel that way. Just this week, a friend of mine lost her daughter, 22 years old, in a skiing accident. A senior in college. Unspeakable tragedy. But all of us in this church, one time or another in our lives, either have or will be touched by suffering, sudden suffering. Some people very recently, some in this church suffering right now. There's a very simple lesson in the gospel. Jesus grasps Peter's mother-in-law's hand and helps her up. This is how Jesus repeatedly heals throughout all of Mark's gospel. 
Later on in the fifth chapter, he takes the daughter of Jairus by the hand and lifts her up. In chapter 9, Jesus takes a young boy who is unable to speak by the hand and helps him up. Jesus didn't know Peter's mother-in-law. He didn't know those townspeople who were ill and in need of healing. He didn't ask whether they were devout Jews or whether they were sinners or who they were. He just grasped their hands and helped them up. Our kindness can be just as powerful and just as surprising. That's what we're called to do. In his second letter to the Corinthians, St. Paul writes that Jesus comforts us in all our afflictions and thus enables us to comfort those who are in trouble. We may not be able to do miracles, but we can grasp our friends' hands and help them up by our presence, by our walking with them, by our prayer, by our acts of kindness and support, we can extend Jesus's busy first day of ministry.